Parker Macintosh. Uh, I've I was born in uh, Prince George, which is uh, up uh, kind of mid British Columbia. So uh, British Columbia has always been very important to me growing up in uh, first in Prince George and then uh, in Vancouver. Uh, but one of the primary things that's always been uh, around uh, is a lot of old things. There's always been historic sites and my grandparents' antiques and uh, just a lot of these things that I think uh, without noticing it have inspired a lot of my interests and of course always asking questions about these old things led to more things, more, more questions about, well, how did this old thing come to be? And, um, and I think one of the, the primary things that got me interested is I've always had a fascination with clothing. Always, always clothing. And I, I remember watching uh, Sherlock Holmes, of course, and that, that sent me on the hunt for uh, a lot of uh, pieces. And this one uh, was actually the very first piece, uh, the very first old thing I, I managed to buy was this. And it's, it's very precious to me though. You know, I have seven of them. It's, uh, it's really a passion. And once I started wearing old hats, I had to have the clothing to go with it. I started making it. There's, um, and there's, I, I kept getting pulled deeper and deeper, um, into the clothing. There's, there's so many little details and I'm very detail oriented. Uh, and so I had to, uh, I wasn't satisfied with just buying patterns. I had to make my own patterns. I had to look at originals. And so I, I collect a lot of pieces. Mostly I remember the television programs. Um, I, I really remember uh, Anne of Green Gables, Road to Avonlea, uh, and Sherlock Holmes. Those were really big inspirations and I remember looking at them uh, on the screen and going, I, I want to dress like that. And uh, again, old family photos and things, I remember uh, looking at them and, and going, well, their clothes were so nice, why don't we have those now? So that's always been a big piece of the inspiration. Uh, there's also, uh, uh, I remember listening and reading books a lot on Egypt, uh, but not so much the Egyptian history, but the people who are digging it up, uh, who of course are uh, turn of the century uh, archeologists. And again, they were wearing the pith helmets, the, the old sort of colonial fashions that got spread all over the world by various um, imperial countries. Uh, but they just had this, this style that just looked so appealing. Uh, and I just, I had to, uh, just had to see what it was like, uh, the full sort of immersion in history. And uh, so from the clothing, it expanded to experiences as well. Um, what was it like to uh, like eat the food and uh, the methods of doing things in old ways, uh, the dip pens and, and ink, just recently I had the chance where I did all my laundry in a period way, all, all the hand washing of laundry. Um, and a, a lot of the interests were very general, uh, just general sort of world history of the 19th and early 20th century. But there's been uh, increasingly, as I, I learn more, and you can see these in the Langman photographs, you see what Vancouver, what British Columbia used to be like. And I've been trying to focus in on uh, the clothing, but also the, the pieces of history uh, that I help share through the clothing. I do a lot of volunteering at historic sites where I uh, help teach some of the, the local history and trying to show some of that through the clothing and uh, pieces that I collect as well. I would refer to myself as either an amateur tailor. I would uh, very much consider myself a historical tailor. And I have actually brought uh, a couple of my, my reference pieces uh, because I go to create the clothing you, 
you might see something in a photograph and you think, well, there's, there's a coat and trousers and waistcoat which make up a suit. How do I make that suit? And to make that suit, the best thing to do is go right back to the beginning. How did they make their suits? And so luckily in the 19th century, the printing press was very much in use. So we have uh, this series of books called The Practical uh, Guide to Cutting. And in it, it comprises of many, many uh, coat patterns and diagrams. Uh, they were very big on self-improvement. And so they show many, many images of the different styles and they, they go through and they, they tell you how, how to make these things pretty much from the two-dimensional pattern that you create right through the stitches uh, step by step. And it's just uh, books like these are invaluable resources. The hardest part is actually finding the fabrics. Uh, the fabrics can be very difficult to find, but it's a lot of uh, research in finding the, the garments, the, the clothes, so that you can feel what the textures were like. You can see how densely they're woven. Uh, you can, uh, there's some companies that reproduce historical fabrics. Uh, there need to be more of those to give us a wider range. Uh, the suit that I'm actually wearing today is one that I uh, recreated. And this is actually recreated from a photograph of the Vancouver Cycling Club in about 1900, maybe uh, a few years prior, maybe 1898. And so it doesn't have a waistcoat uh, as in the photographs. It's just the two pieces, the short trousers called knickerbockers or plus fours, or in this case, they're actually called knicker breeches for some reason in the pattern that I was using. Uh, but it's pretty much a pretty standard 1890s tweed suit. And I actually got the pattern from one of my books you can see the illustration there, and there's also the, I believe somewhere in here, there's the flat pattern. Yeah, there's, that's what I start with, is that pattern, and I took that, used my own measurements, and I, I ended up getting this, this suit in the end. So it's, it's quite the process. It takes many, many hours, a lot of hand stitching, uh, a lot of, just a lot of practice that goes into these things. Uh, but it all, it all pays off when uh, you can actually wear the piece and experience the piece of history. All I need now is one of the, the bicycles with the big wheels in, in front, though those seem a bit scary. <laughs> these are pieces uh, that uh, some that I uh, have reproduced. Uh, I, I have gone to uh, Montreal, uh, and in Montreal there were, they wear very different fashions to uh, Vancouver, very different climate. And one of the pieces that uh, was very common in Montreal was a lot of fur. Uh, so for the, the cold of Montreal, I made myself this uh, reproduction, again copied from a photograph, of a fur astrakhan waistcoat reproduced from uh, an original, uh, what is it? It's reproduced, ah, I, recycled fur, that's the word I'm looking for, recycled. Uh, so it's recycled fur from a 1980s, 80s coat, but the pockets are practically invisible. And this I had again, a lot, a lot of information just from books talking about what the backs looked like because from the photographs you could never tell what the back looked like if it only shows the front. So that's one piece that I've reproduced and one of my favorites. And here we have a, another waistcoat. This is an original one from probably about 1890. Uh, this one actually is made by uh, a company from New York and we can see by the, the buttons, uh, the button holes and the buttons, it's actually a double-breasted waistcoat in what feels like a, a cotton tartan, which is kind of odd. I haven't seen any other cotton tartan waistcoats before made like this. So that's a piece that I plan on reproducing, uh, hopefully soon. 
Uh, it's a, a piece that happens to fit me, so making a pattern from it will be very easy. And just pieces like this inspire me a, a, a lot. Hi. Hi. Very good. Do you need some of the other photographs up? Or? Uh, yeah, at some point we'll go down maybe and you can flip through it and you will tell me what okay, well you do. Okay, whatever you want to do. Okay. There's those here too. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I brought a couple of photographs for you to look at as well. Okay. Well, so, do you uh, want me to look at them? Sure. A lot of them are just found from individuals who. Uh, mention yeah. them as coming from their family up in the interior or things Second like that. Second World War, I think. That's some actually of them. Um, First World War. First World War. Yeah. It's yeah, I can see the uniforms. Are yeah. We oh yeah, are, this, this is definitely <laughs> just yeah. at that period. But I thought thought you'd be able to appreciate some of those. It's uh, some. I found quite a few that were just in a box labeled Vancouver. Yeah. Um, I love that one. Yes, that's delightful. That one was uh, taken in Coquitlam in okay. uh, 1901. 1901. I think so. Oh, oh no. 1899. 1899. Yeah. 1899. Yeah. That's very nice. From uh, it looks. To be from a play or something. Yeah, that's what I thought. A Christmas play. And there's two of those ones. Yeah. That I wonder if it's the same, uh, uh, same, same school family. because this photograph and these were all in the same. Yeah. Same box. Most likely. Yeah. Not that you don't have too much no no history with them. I no. all I all I know is that they are. British Columbia. Yeah. Nothing more. Yeah, they're delightful. Those two, I was told, were uh, Vancouver. Yeah. Might be North Vancouver because there's a very big fence. Yes. <laughs> Keep the bears out. Yeah, that's. Very nice. Uh, a lot of people, uh, things like uh, picnic scenes, those came with the ones of the, the yep. schoolboys. Yep. That was very nice. The, very nice. Yeah. The history. I love that one. Yeah. It looks like they've gone out on a hike somewhere. And that yeah. one. Um, yeah, it's on a big. On a big hill, it could. Yeah. It probably is North Vancouver. Well, that one I was told might be actually in the interior. It was. Uh, could be Burnaby yeah. too. Yeah. Um, well, uh, that one again. Yeah. A uh, boy dressed up as First World War soldier. Yeah, Hunter. That's a nice print. Yeah, I wasn't certain what that, that might be, but it I was don't an know. interesting. It, it looks print. like silver. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's different. I don't know what that is. Must be up north. That's, um,. I got it with another photograph that I gave to my mother. Um, and the other photograph is similar looking mountains, but with a fellow on a frozen lake with a dog sled. Mm -hmm. uh, so it might be up north, it might be from the uh, Yukon. Yukon. So. Yeah, that's a typical house from 1880s, I guess. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Lots of history. Uh, so, these are the few I've put together, but seeing how many you have is just so incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the, the history of the sternwheelers. And yeah, when yeah. I saw the photographs of the sternwheelers, and then I and looked up here, and my jaw just about dropped. Yeah, we just pulled that a month ago. It's incredible.
incredible. That's awesome. You must have been so pleased to yeah, have yeah, found I was really a happy piece with that. like that. Because so many of them just got burnt or, or sunk or blew up, some of them. Yeah, they were not easy to make. It was a lot of work. And, and uh, what about here, the distributor, I think, yeah. uh, is one that I haven't actually heard of before. Yeah. Uh, it was built in 1913. So it's a little bit of a late one. It is a late one. Yeah. Well, good luck with your Thank you. review. Thank you very much for coming here. Oh, you're welcome. So most of these are just photographs I either acquired one by one uh, from various various sources, but all with the the background that they're presumably British Columbia or Vancouver. Uh, so they're pretty much uh, what you can can see there in the photograph. A lot of photographs of of people, uh, but these are all the important thing is they're they're people of British Columbia, and so I I, I love many of these photos, especially with the the children because they have such interesting little poses and things. Of uh, this one's pose there with the the gun. Uh, or this one where they're wearing, uh, they're holding holding chickens in a cornfield, uh, but also dressed up uh, as a first world, world first world war soldier there, and a picnic on top of some mountain, presumably somewhere near Vancouver, but you can see how dressed up they are: the long skirts, the bowler hats, the suits, and that was to go hiking. Uh, so I, I just admire that, that, that style of the day now. We'd go in t-shirts and shorts and a backpack and they had to carry it with, with one arm, a whole huge picnic hamper. This one's uh, pretty hard to see, but it looks like a very, a very poor family who's probably only just getting by, but a lot of children and a lot of the people who would have come out to British Columbia would have been very much like this family, hoping for a, a better, better life and determined to to make it so with uh, hard work. And what was there before before they came in life? Before they came it would have been uh, the First Nations. Uh, before this family, this family looks to be 1890s so there would have been some settlements such as uh, New Westminster, uh, Port Langley and Victoria but many of these uh, more recent immigrants uh, came into areas such as uh, Vancouver in the 1890s. Uh, in 1900, Vancouver had just had a huge boom uh, and grew extremely quickly with the logging and mining industries that were feeding into it. Again, here we have picnickers, uh, quite a few of them. Again, suits and bowler hats, long, long skirts and the, a lot of uh, big hair and big hats for the ladies there. The ladies trying on some of the, the men's bowlers, having some fun. Could have been something like Dominion Day or uh, some kind of celebration. This one's uh, pretty early in Vancouver. This is uh, 1880s and it, it mar mentions part of the, the date on the, the back. Uh, Feb February 12th something. 1880 something it's hard to tell but uh, that's a very nice one and I like that very much and you can see how how much wilderness there is uh, and the little pram and the hat the boys suit there they're quite dressed up for the photo but uh, obviously there must have been no photographic studios around again a, a very dressed up family you can see the high fence in the back uh, dressed up for their photograph. Again, probably lower mainland. And this is a, a small collection of photos I got all together. Uh, and these are, I believe, the interior of uh, BC somewhere. There's, there's quite a few of these, uh, the bathing suits. Uh, 
my favorite ones are uh, again these these fellows, uh, the Highlanders uh, of the First World War. You can see their their large uh, khaki tams. and the kilts. And then it looks like high socks and puttees, trousers. I find this one very interesting. This one has, a, again, a picnic, a sort of picnic group. And right here, there's what looks to be a tripod uh, holding holding a pot here. And this is probably, probably my favorite of all the photos. Uh, it's this boy dressed up probably as Father Christmas and he just, he looks fabulous in his outfit. If I was his age, I would, uh, if I was him, I would, would have just been so pleased and that's 18. 99 in Coquitlam, which must have been just the middle of nowhere in, in the 1890s. And I think possibly from the same, same school that that boy went to was this group. I actually have two of these ones. All dressed up for a photo again. And what I love about this is the, the organ in the back. My family actually had uh, a pipe organ similar to this, a uh, pump organ, sorry, a pump organ similar to this in uh, Winnipeg. Uh, but they've got all their, their family photos on here and I think that's just a, a lovely piece. And then this, this is a very typical style wooden house of the late 19th century in, in uh, the Lower Mainland, likely Vancouver, uh, with the, the children posing on the, the deck there. So I'm, I reproduce all kinds of things, and this is one of the older pieces I've, I've reproduced, again, directly from original. And this is actually uh, a pre-tied sort of bow tie, or what we'd call a cravat, and you kind of wear it with one of the high collars there. And this one would be kind of about 1850 thereabouts. And that's, that's a, again, a favorite piece to wear when I'm out at Fort Langley, kind of sharing our, our fur trade history. In the, the black, it's very, very somber and would have fit in with kind of the sort of social status of a, a clerk of the, the fur trade. And then we go right to the the other end, that's the very earliest sort of stuff I reproduce. And we go right up to the, the First World War. And this is actually reproduced uh, directly from an original in the collection of Ivan Sayers. Uh, the original belonging to a captain, I don't remember uh, his name, but it was a captain in the, the First World War who was with the Canadians who served in Sicily. And this is a reproduction of his, his cap. And he came from Chilliwack originally. So again, kind of local BC history that I get to reproduce. And, and I wear this quite often, actually. It's a very, very nice piece to wear. And why? Then, I mean, I'm curious about First World War. Well, I feel a great connection to the First World War. Uh, it was, if you think about it, sort of my generation 100 years ago that was in this uh, situation of the, the First World War and uh, they were the ones going out and uh, fighting. And so I feel a kind of a great connection. There's a, exactly a hundred years that divides us. And for some reason that um, feels very, very important to me and uh, important to remember. And so uh, I very much enjoy reproducing these pieces. I wear them at reenactments, I wear them uh, sometimes in uh, daily life. Uh, there's a lot of uh, little personal pieces I also add, like things like my uh, watch chain, which is uh, has this little fob, and uh, I, you probably won't be able to see it, 
but it's 1919, August 4th, uh, which is when we celebrated uh, the peace of the First World War. Uh, but it also marks when our troops came back, even though the war ended nearly a year earlier. Uh, it took them many months to actually get back here to Vancouver because we're so far away from the fighting uh, of the First World War. So that that, signif that uh, has significance because it's uh, a piece of local Vancouver history, but also First World War. And so I, I have many of those uh, sort of First World War pieces. Uh, uh, again, these are uh, probably my the newest piece to my collection, and they're the the jodhpurs. Uh, so they're what you would call elephant ear breeches or riding breeches, jodhpurs, uh, worn by the officers uh, in the First World War. And things like this are very hard to come by now, and I feel very fortunate to be able to. Uh, acquire such a piece for my collection and to be able to copy it uh, so that uh, we can wear these for reenactments for ceremonies uh, or I guess even if you wanted to go horse riding you could you could still wear something like this there's of course the the loss of uh, life there's also um, it's the end of an era and it's um, uh, the end of an era that I find absolutely fascinating. It's kind of the grand finale to the whole thing. Uh, the world was very different after the First World War. Society changed very quickly. We had about a hundred years of this one society uh, that you traces its roots much further back, but this sort of Victorian Edwardian society that just came to this sort of horrific end. Uh, with such a loss of life, uh, and it's just uh, sort of remembering the whole tragedy, but also the individuals. Uh, each of these pieces, the breeches, uh, the watch chain, they all belong to individual people who all have their individual stories, which as you learn more about them, they're just fascinating stories of what these people went through. And uh, again, uh, that brings me into these experiences and what these experiences were like. And by recreating pieces and wearing them and going to reenactments, you can get the smallest taste of what it was like. You'll never know what it was like, but you can get just the slightest idea. And that's kind of the inspiration for it and the reason for the those first world war pieces and many others do you have an example of some of the stories that you've heard about these people oh there's there's so many unfortunately with my my personal pieces uh i don't don't have many stories connected to them i know there must be stories there all i know about the the fellow with the, the breeches is that he took a lot of um, off time. He, he took many trips back to Britain away from the trenches. Uh, so he must have been very lucky and perhaps one of the reasons he made it through the war. Uh, I was very, the stories of the recent film put out by Peter Jackson were incredible. Uh, the we Shall Not Grow Old, I very much enjoyed that. Uh, what I find also fascinating is the music of the time. The music tell tells a lot of uh, stories in it. Uh, there's a lot of the, the trench songs, the First World War songs, that give a, an idea of what these uh, fellows were going through. I do have this coat. Uh, this is another piece that uh, I hope to reproduce uh, fairly soon. And it's actually, it's very similar to, to what I'm wearing now, just, just a little bit different in the the shape here, you can see how uh, it's a little bit longer, a little bit more cut away. And this piece dates from the 1890s, and this one came from Toronto, actually. It's uh, uh, a lot of my family come from uh, Toronto, and so I get to visit and go find wonderful things there. This is this is the hat, but these hats, being uh, very very delicate, uh, require quite a bit of sort of protection when they are being stored or carried around. 
And so actually the box is probably, often the boxes sell for more than the hats. Uh, and this is what you'd actually call a bucket because of the, 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 the shape. And just if it opens up, we have uh, a striped lining and it's the inside is entirely shaped to the hat. So the hat just fits in quite nicely there. And then And this no longer has its buckles or locks. They've, they've disappeared, uh, broken off. But once buckled up, this would have been uh, quite solid, as solid as a steamer trunk. And you could have taken this on a train. You could have put it on top of a carriage, all kinds of places. And it would have protected the hat, even if it tumbled off or got crushed or something. They're very sturdy boxes or uh, buckets. And uh, they're just so very useful. I've dropped this a couple times and the hat's been entirely all right. Uh, limited space on top of the wardrobe, they often end up getting pushed off. And may I ask sort of like, how do you find the money from, or is it the family, or is it your work? Is it more so I've been trying to, uh, uh, create, uh, I guess, create my own business or uh, kind of create myself a, a job reproducing clothing. I, I have friends and uh, a few clients who, who get me to make pieces for them to wear. I just finished a pair of uh, blue trousers for a fellow at, out at Fort Langley, a friend of mine, uh, who will be wearing them for historical reenactments uh, later this, this August. Uh, as well as I've been making a lot of coats recently, and hopefully I can get that to a point where that will be how I, I make my living. Uh, at the moment, I've been, been doing part-time work with tailor shops. Uh, I've been working with uh, and apprenticing to a friend of mine who's a kilt maker, uh, and uh, just kind of buying and selling as well, uh, pieces of vintage clothing and antiques a little bit. Uh, I have a friend who's, who's visiting to uh, pick up a few pieces and take them back to Toronto tomorrow. Uh, so it's, it, it's a little bit tricky sometimes finding, finding the money or making money from uh, making historical clothing, but I, I'm going to persist and s see if I can make it work. Let's hope. Now, are you interested in cinema at all? I mean, you mentioned to the Jackson... Uh, it does a lot to inspire me. I find um, uh, his most recent uh, historical piece with the uh, We Shall Not Grow Old, that was quite, quite an inspiring piece. Uh, but primarily uh, just that, that start with um, uh, kind of the Sherlock Holmes, a lot of those old television shows. Uh, un unfortunately, I, I just haven't had a lot of time to watch a lot of films. It's, it is enjoyable, but, um, uh, but also working on such pieces, uh, I'm entirely willing to. I just uh, need someone to, to ask me to, pretty much. Uh, it can be a little bit intimidating trying to get your way into film work or cinema and things like that. And as maybe to participate to a larger group of makers that would do historical pieces for war film? Or... Uh, that's um, definitely, again, something I would do if I was, if I was asked. It's just, uh, uh, it can be intimidating to get yourself into uh, a little bit. Uh, but also, um, really, it's uh, just needing to be asked if I was uh, my hope is once I, I start making more historical clothing, that may gain notice and uh, may eventually been used, may be used in, in films and things like that. Uh, again, also uh, making for possibly prop warehouses and things. There's costume warehouses that require a lot of historical pieces. And actually, I have, uh, have sold a few of my older pieces that I used to wear too some clothing uh, warehouses for film.
so you say archives. Um, I find archives are incredible, especially the, when they've been digitized and put online. Uh, photographic archives are, are just such a, a great resource. Uh, again, like the photograph I use to base my suit off of is one from the Vancouver uh, archives that are all, all put online. And so I can go and I can pick out the little, little details. And so it's uh, very important that these things get digitized and put online and, and saved and uh, saved from uh, fires as well. That's always a big fear of collectors and archivists or fires. So when we put these things online and they can reach a wider audience, they can uh, help researchers all over. Uh, I, I actually, my, one of my own ambitions is with my, my tailoring books, my tailoring manuals, which I have about 30 of, uh, they're, they're fairly hard to find and there are a lot of people who are part of the growing vintage clothing sort of movement and historical clothing that are starting to make these uh, historical outfits all over the world, but they don't have the same access to the old books. So I'd love to create an archive someday of tailoring books uh, that could be put put online and uh, preserve these pieces. Uh, I've gone on, on trips to uh, Toronto and Montreal just to look at some of the, the old tailoring books to, to learn from them. And again, those are things that uh, it would be fabulous to just get them online as a uh, put together archive. So one of the, the events I always look forward to is uh, Fort Langley's uh, Brigade Days, which is an event that happens uh, once a year. I, I look forward to it very much. And it's an event where I get to uh, dress up along with 50 of my, my friends and other volunteers. We encamp in the fort and we share the history of both the fur trade of uh, Canada and specifically the fur trade in the British Columbia region, as well as the, the gold rush of British Columbia, uh, or at least the Fraser Gold Rush. There are many gold rushes of British Columbia. Uh, the 1850s uh, Gold Rush, 1858, is a rush that uh, takes place uh, on the shores of the Fraser River uh, up near Yale. And that's uh, something like, I think it was 30,000 30, miners that flooded into British Columbia and really uh, kicked off many aspects of our our history. The whole reason British Columbia becomes a crown colony is because of the, the gold rush uh, that kind of kicked that all off. And the gold rush really came on the tail end of the, the fur industry that was just beginning to die because of the, the lack of beaver and the lack of uh, market for beaver as the fashions for fur hats had switched to silk hats. And so we share both, both those aspects, uh, but most importantly, how they came together to uh, form our, our crown colony and now our, our province of, of Canada. I'm curious about um, yeah, the fur trade and um, the gold rush, more about the aspects of um, wildlife depletion. Uh, I don't know much about the wildlife depletion, uh, but you can look back in the records and you can see how many uh, uh, animals they're actually trapping every year, how much uh, is being traded in. Uh, some years uh, it's just phenomenal, uh, overwhelming uh, amounts uh, that you can hardly comprehend. Uh, and other years you can see where it's taken a drastic cut. Uh, but here in British Columbia, I don't know how far the wildlife depletion got. It didn't get nearly as uh, far as it did back east. Uh, but it was being felt, uh, and really there was just a, the change from the, the beaver fur top hats to the silk top hats that really changed that. Uh, in other wildlife depletion, uh, sturgeon, which were another aspect of the, the fur trade, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company traded for isinglass, which comes from uh, the sturgeon, and it was uh, the sturgeon populations noticeably fell in that fur trade period as well. So this is a, a, one of my, my very precious, precious books, uh, a wonderful resource. Oh, let's, let's get you the, the title page there. So it's the Practicals, 
it's the Cutter's Practical Guide to Coat Cutting and Making. Morning coats, frock coats, and dress coats, which are all the, the formal Victorian and, and Edwardian coats. And we go through the, the preface. But what's lovely about these books is the, the patterns. And so he, here we have a pattern for a morning coat. We have many, many kinds of styles. There's, there's endless variations of these things. And it just gives you immense amounts of information, all these little dotted lines and squiggles. They all are explained in the text as having meaning, especially in here where they all represent different stitches and techniques of making. And then you go through, oh, these. These actually don't belong to this book, but belong to another book. And these are fashion plates of the 1870s that were given to me by a very dear friend, Peter Fox, uh, who uh, some people may know as uh, starting the Fox and Fluvog shoe store. And he's been a very big inspiration to me, and he's helped me very much in my, my research, and uh, he, he gave me these. Uh, these were, uh, I believe, in his family, possibly, or something he collected when he was back uh, in, in Britain, where he, he lived before he came to Canada. So those are uh, a very precious piece that are a great resource for looking at uh, color and styles uh, seems like the greatest fashion in all of these is that you have to be holding some kind of cigar. But back to the book, we have many different styles here. Uh, morning coat for the muscular or working man, uh, the, the corpulent draft for th those uh, that are a little bit larger. This shows many of the different methods of making uh, hair cloth and canvas inside a lot of the structure. Uh, some people say these coats uh, are built like armor and in many ways it's, it's true. You feel very secure, very protected in them. And they help give a lot of confidence when you have the, the right clothes. Here we start seeing some of the other styles of coats that come down very straight. These are called frock coats and kind of considered the, the typical uh, garment of the uh, sort of quintessential garment of the 19th century, often worn with the, or almost always worn with the top hat. And then the, what many people would call a tail coat, uh, but I would call a dress coat as it's what they call, call it in the, the book, is an evening dress coat for white tie and again, in the, the dress coats, we have many different styles of, of lapels, different numbers of buttons. And then under the category of body coats or uh, sort of formal wear, we have all these other garments. Uh, so this is a governor's uh, court dress and a unofficial court dress. This actually looks very much like Edward VII here. And all this pattern in here would have been uh, embroidery, which would have been thousands and thousands of what Stitch is called bullion embroidery, which is actual metal thread. Some of the military uniforms, military uh, dress coats or tail coats. There's just a huge, huge wealth. This gets mostly, mostly into formal wear. There's some things like this, a fireman's tunic. There's a very similar looking fireman's tunic uh, of the Victoria Fire Department uh, from the 1880s in the Provincial Museum. 
policeman's uniform. Many policemen across the, the world would have used this, this style of uniform. Uh, in fact, you see it in Vancouver in the early 1900s. And it's all based off of the Metropolitan Police of London. Court dress. These large, large, long buttonholes with the ceremonial uh, buttons. Livery coachman's state coat. You still see outfits like this uh, worn in the royal household. Other than that, there's, there's very little need to, to make such garments. Except for fun, if you want to wear them. It's just fun to wear some of these things. Oh, another photograph. This is very similar to actually what I'm wearing today. Uh, this is actually for, uh, a fellow looking over the Rhine in Germany in about, I think, 1913. Another, another gift from a, a, a friend who collects German clothing. And I think that brings us to a part we've seen now, so. Yes.